All right, good morning, everybody. Jim Schwartz here, Director of Agronomy and PFR here at Bex Hybrids. Really pleased to have you uh, join us this morning. And um, you know, it's, uh, this has not been the most uh, enjoyable spring so far. I know some of you got a lot of corn in early, and then we've had this spate of rain. So there's a lot of questions, a lot of feedback we're getting, and we just thought we would um, have a quick uh, webinar this morning to walk you through some of the decision-making processes. I'm really pleased to have Brent Minot join us this morning to uh, help uh, walk you through some of the decisions. And then um, if you have questions as you go through, all the lines will be muted. So in the kind of the lower right-hand part of your screen, there's a Q&A dialog box. Feel free to type your questions in there. And then we'll have time at the end of the call for questions and or if uh, it's something that I need to jump in and ask Brent, I will do that as well. So really please, please feel free to uh, interact with questions. We want to uh, we want to make sure we answer what you uh, want to know. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to introduce Brent and he's going to take us through about what, 14 slides, Brent? Yep. And um, walk us through some of the decision-making processes for replant and delayed planning decisions. Brent, take it away. Thank you, Jim. Good to be here this morning with you all. Uh, again, my name is Brent Minot. I'm a field agronomist for Bex. I cover Northeast Indiana uh, in the state of Michigan. Um, this has been a challenging spring, depending on where you're from. Um, a lot of rainfall and here recently some cold temperatures. And so makes uh, replant and, and or plant delayed planting decisions uh, fairly tough. When you see this image on the screen, uh, to me, you know, that, that kind of evokes a lot of thoughts, right? You see water standing in a field, and it's really hard to tell if that field's even been planted. And so uh, when you think about that, um, you know, every spring we start off with the best laid plans. Uh, we spend all winter agonizing over what our starter program is going to be like. Are we going to change closing wheels on our planter? Um, you know, and, and hope springs eternal uh, in the spring. And so we, we start out with the best laid plans. And unfortunately, every year, somewhere in our marking area, Mother Nature has her say. And so that changes our plans. We very often don't end up with that perfect stand um, that we have. And so when that happens, those best laid plans, we very often get very emotional about what happened. We're frustrated. Maybe it's a field right outside uh, your office window or your dining room window, kitchen window. And so it, it frustrates you that it's not as good as it as it could have been, uh, even though you may have had the very best plan you could put together before the season started. And so today what I hope to do is try to help your decision making if you're in the process of doing this and change it from emotion to logic. Okay, and, and we're all emotional creatures. I get emotional about a lot of things, but when we make replant decisions, we need to do the best job we can to eliminate the emotion and look at it from a logical perspective. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is heat accumulation uh, right off the get-go before we get into some decision-making matrices and start doing a little math. Uh, we really got to talk about how heat is accumulated. It takes about 100 to 120 growing degree days for corn to emerge, okay? So if I look at Atlanta, Indiana today, um, the high forecast is 75 and the low is 51. So if I think about that, and I assume that's going to be true, I add those two together, divide by two to come up with a mean daily temperature of 63, okay? I subtract 50 from that, and that gives me the 13 growing degree days um, accumulation for the today, uh, May 11th. Now, if I get that every day for the next eight or nine days and I plant today, then corn will emerge. Um, my point with this slide is this, this spring, in a lot of areas, we've not accumulated very much heat. And so uh, some areas we've had about right around six growing degree units per day. And so now when you do the math on that, it takes 17 to 20 days for a corn plant to emerge. And then if you throw in a few areas like where I work, where we've had completely saturated soils with no oxygen, um, then that even adds to the number of days it requires um, to get that out of the ground. So the key, key points of that is, is it takes oxygen, it takes moisture, and it takes heat to get a corn seed to emerge. And so what we have lacked in a lot of areas is that heat. And that's how heat is accumulated. And um, you also note a couple notes at the bottom there in the calculation that the daily low is less than 50, you always use 50 as your low, and if the daily high is over 86, you always use 86. And so a um, little information about how to calculate growing degree days, but more about the fact that we have not committed much heat 
And so that seed's sitting there just waiting for enough heat to go ahead and sprout uh, and emerge from the ground. Now, when you think about a logical decision, there's some information we need to make those logical decisions. Right off the get-go, we need to know what the original planting date was for the crop, okay? And then we need to go out in that field if it's not too muddy and we don't need waders to get out there, we need to go out and establish what our plant stand is. Now, in a lot of fields this year that I've been in, it's really hard at this point to even know what the stand is because we're in the middle of emergence. We've got some plants up, other plants that are not. Um, and, you know, from, from a standpoint of looking at a seed that's not emerged yet, I can, I can make an educated guess about whether this one's going to make it or that one won't. Um, but really, until they're emerged and we have some sort of a final stand, it's hard to make a real good logical decision about whether we should replant or not. And so, but when we gather that, those two pieces of information, now we can use a chart like this. This is various charts you've seen probably, whether it's in one of your uh, university handbooks that you get uh, to make, help you make agronomic decisions. This happens to be adapted from uh, Emerson Nassiggers at University of Illinois. Um, and so you see various planting dates down the left-hand side and then various final stands. And so, for example, I'm going to use my cursor here. And so let's, let's take an example here on the 20th of April. I planted corn and, and it's been tough, it's been wet, and I have a final stand. You see my cursor laying there on 93. And so at 22,000, plant on the 20th of April, that's obviously a reduced stand, significantly reduced stand, but I can still expect uh, and that cursor keeps disappearing there. I can still expect about 93% yield um, based upon that information. Now, obviously there's some things that would change uh, that information. For example, let's say that 93 on 22,000 on 20th of April. Now today it's the 11th, so I go down here to the 10th of May, and what if I came in and replanted 32,000 on the 10th of May? Now I could expect about 97% yield. So I'm comparing 93 to 97. That's only 4% difference. Technically, under that scenario, I could replant. If I could replant today, it would make me money. Okay. Now there is replant is not free, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But in that scenario, uh, it would pay for me to replant. Okay. But let's look at that another way. Same planting date, same original stand of 22,000 planted the 20th of April. Now let's drop down and maybe it's rained today and I can't get in the field until the 20th of May. So we go across there to the 20th of May and I'm going to seed 32,000. And now I'm only sitting at 91% of my optimal yield. Is replant a good decision in this scenario? May or may not be, but in that case, I'm probably going to look a little bit harder. And there's some other factors I like to look at that may cause me to skew or move, move my decision one way or the other. One is the uniformity of stand, okay? And that's literally how uneven is the stand. Do I have patches and ponds in the field where I have virtually nothing? Okay, obviously I might want to replant those areas. Um, or do I just have an uneven stand with uneven emergence? In that case, case, if it's very uneven, I might still make the decision to replant in that scenario, okay? I might not if I have a very even stand. In fact, I might even if the stand is very even, I might even make the decision to live with a little lower population than even that 22,000. And again, that's based upon calendar date. And obviously our, our opportunity to get into the field and make that replant operation is a key part of this. Uh, today in central Indiana, we had our shower here last night um, and we were pretty wet to start with. And so guy, a guy in this scenario in central Indiana probably is going to be five days away, even if we get good drying temperatures and a lot of wind, before he can make a replant decision. And so that is going to skew me back the other way. Now, many of you have seen charts like this over the years, and, and uh, you've probably said, well, this, this is old data. You can see it's back in the mid-90s. This doesn't apply to the hybrids and, uh, that I, I plant today. And so uh, that's a legitimate argument. I think you could potentially adjust some of these numbers up a little bit. We have a lot less flexier hybrids than we did uh, many years ago. Uh, but, but I still think it's good information. It does give us a matrix that we can at least start to base our de decision about whether we should replant or not. This uh, information that was, uh, we had showing a lot of university data from multiple universities over multiple years is backed up in our practical farm research. This is a four-year 
replant study we did uh, at multiple locations at our PFR farms. And uh, you can see uh, this data was done using a 20,000 stand versus a 34,000 stand. So 20,000, pretty marginal on whether uh, we should keep that stand. And yet when you look at this curve, yeah, if we can make a replant operation and come back in with 34,000 uh, on the 30th of April, uh, we stand to, in this case, over four years, profit by almost $100 uh, per acre. But now let's look as time goes on. Uh, we move into May 15th, for example, still pays to replant in that 34,000 versus 20,000 scenario. What happens in late May starts to be a little less profitable. And then about June 1st, it's a wash, okay? And so many of the fields I've walked this spring and where I'm at, we've had 24, 26,000 in the fields where we can make stand estimates. Um, and so in that scenario, my guess is that curve is going to be a lot steeper. Um, and so we might see a time where even by the 15th or the 20th of May, it's going to pay to leave that stand out there at 24 to 26,000. Um, if we let our emotions make that decision for us, um, it's not, you know, we're going to go ahead and replant. Um, but what I want you to think about is not use those emotions uh, and, and use logic. And logic says uh, we're going to profit the most by, uh, by living with that 24 or 25,000 stand. A couple of notes on soybeans. We talked a lot about corn, and I think a lot of the principles uh, are still the same. Um, very often with soybeans, it's an easier decision. Uh, and why is that? Um, mainly, soybeans are able to compensate for stand loss much more readily than corn, okay? Stand is very, very important in corn, um, not nearly as important in beans. We may seed 150,000 with a 15-inch planter, uh, and due to a lot of circumstances, rainfall and all the challenges we have uh, routinely, only end up with 100,000 out there, okay? And so is that enough? We lost a third of our stand. Um, but the nice thing about soybeans is they branch out and compensate for additional spacing that you give them. In fact, on, on some of our seed acres a few years ago here at Bex, uh, we had a variety we planted at 75,000 and ended up with a 50,000 stand. Now, we would never tell you to do that, but we were trying to get more acres out of a brand new seed variety. So we planted at 75, ended up with 50, and those beans made over 70, 70 bushels per acre. Okay, now, was that a you know, was that anomaly or is that repeatable? Very often we plant beans very, very thin to get more acres and more bushels out of those for seed. So now the challenge becomes weed control. Uh, when you plant that thin, uh, what becomes weed control? But today, looking at beans, and not a lot of beans are up in the area I work, but just starting to emerge, um, um, certainly 100,000 is an area I would, I would never replant, um, and even down to about the 80,000 level before I would pull the trigger on a bean replant operation. It's interesting that we've backed that up in practical farm research. If you were at one of our PFR Insight meetings this winter, we talked a lot about economic optimum seeding rate. And you can see that on the screen now. And so when you look at the seeding rate that makes you the most money, and this is a PFR proven practice, um, so we have at least three years of data that backs this up, um, we have found that 100,000, and that's the seeding rate, so you know our final stands are in the 90s somewhere, um, makes us the most money, okay? Now, I know today if I told a lot of you, and I shared a lot of growers this winter, that you should be seeding beans at 100, I get it. You're probably not going to do that, especially if you're at 160 or 170 or even 200,000. But our thought and our goal uh, as a agronomy team here at Bex and as a seed company is we favor uh, reducing seeding rates with beans. And isn't that refreshing that a seed company would come out and tell you to use less seed? But in the case of soybeans, the numbers don't lie. And again, uh, we're, we're out to help you farm better, uh, help you make better decisions, and that's why we're doing the webinar today. Let's jump in and talk a little bit of a, a separate topic and yet similar in a lot of ways, and that's delayed planting. Um, you can see some images there on the screen. Uh, equipment sitting there in a rain-filled barnyard and, or sitting out in the field and, and uh, not being able to get to the field. I don't know what's more frustrating. Uh, I've been in both positions. What's more frustrating, having to wait to plant or having your seed out there sitting uh, in very wet, saturated soils or scenarios that make you have to make a replant decision? And so delayed planting is frustrating. We know, uh, based upon the geography that we sell in now, that 
people are experiencing this in the north. I cover the state of Michigan, and I know some of the guys in Michigan, there's very little corn planted uh, up in those areas, and there's been rain there the last couple of days. So what are the decision-making criteria? What do we need to be thinking about relative to delayed planting? And, and let's talk about why we worry about delayed planting. What's the concern? Why do you sit and are concerned about delayed planting? Well, first of all, we say in PFR, and really anybody will tell you, that early planting pays. And so now you're saying that I'm not going to get an opportunity to plant early. In fact, I'm going to plant late. How much is that really costing me? I mean, I know early planting pays, uh, and now I can't do it. So that causes us to worry. We think that if we plant late, our crop won't, we won't, will not reach black layer, okay? And certainly as you move north, that becomes a concern where heat becomes limiting. In much of the Corn Belt, uh, southern two-thirds of Indiana, southern two-thirds of Illinois, uh, state of Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, all those areas, heat's not usually a problem. We accumulate enough heat. Uh, but as you move north of the areas I just mentioned, certainly that is a concern. Increased harvest moisture, that's often a concern. Boy, if I plant late, I stick with the same hybrids I have. Um, now I'm going to be harvesting 24, 25 percent corn when I'd really better harvest because of storage reasons or the cost of drying. I'd really rather harvest that corn at, at 17 or 18 percent. That's certainly a legitimate concern. And the last one is, frankly, just low commodity prices. And when we have low commodity prices, we often have lower margins. And so uh, that, that is a, a definite concern. Um, you know, and, and frankly, it should be a concern any time, no matter what the commodity price or the margins are. Um, we don't want to leave bushels on the table. And so that also causes us to worry uh, about delayed planning and planning late in the season. So when we think about planting date and we analyze its value or what it brings to the table relative to our yields year in and year out, um, one, and I think it was Purdue, but I'm not sure, looked at all the yield influencing factors, YIF, okay? And so there are many out there, and certainly planting date is an important one. Um, when you look at corn planted uh, after May 1st, you see that yield potential based upon long-term data is reduced somewhere between 0.3 and 1% per day as I plant later and later into the month of May, okay? Um, yield planting data accounts for only 23% of the yield variability from year to year. So even though it's very, very important, there's still other yield factors. So let's talk about some of those other yield influencing factors. How about weather pollination? How about fertility? How about pH? How about drainage? Uh, all those factors play a very, very important part. So my point is, is that yes, we may have taken some off the top end, but it doesn't mean just because we planted late that we can't have optimum yields or profitable yields. If you look at these charts, and it may be a little small depending on how big your screen is, you can see the departure from trend yield compared to the percent of corn acres planted, and this is uh, in the state of Indiana uh, over a nine-year period, 93 to 2012. And so to simplify this graph, basically as you move left to right uh, on the graph there at that 0% line, and I'll put my cursor on it, you can see that as we move to a higher percentage planted, in general that red line does increase. So the more corn planted in the state of Indiana by April 30th does equate to, on the average, higher yields, okay? But let's look over here at 2009, for example. In 2009, we only had less than 10% of the corn was planted in the state of Indiana. And yet we had a greater than almost a 10% departure from average yield or a 10% increase in average yields that year, okay? Now let's even go over in the other graph and look at corn planted by May 15th. Again, the more corn's planted, the earlier the corn is planted, our average yields do go up, but there's 2009 again. Only 20% of the corn was planted um, by May 15th, and yet we had very, very high yields, 10% over the trend line during that time period. So talk to many growers, Mary, a lot of anecdotal evidence from people um, that says, yeah, I, I like to plant corn early, but I remember the year that I planted corn June 6th, and that was my best corn. And so it's an important yield limiting factor, uh, yield influencing factor, but it's not the only factor that influences yield. And so still have the opportunity. There's no reason to uh, hang your head and worry that I cannot have high yielding corn just because I did not plant in April. 
Let's talk about relative hybrid maturity. Very often as we get later and later in the season and the corn is not planted, uh, people want to trade in their longer maturity hybrids for shorter maturity hybrids. So I want to help you understand what relative maturity means. First of all, it's relative, okay? And so it's an estimate. Very often people say, well, if it's 110-day corn, does that mean it should take 110 days from emergence to black layer? Yeah, that's an estimate. We, we rate all our hybrids by growing degree days, and we'll do a little math in a little bit that'll depict that. But, but it's just relative. And in fact, when you look at the math, and as you plant uh, later and later into the season, you can actually reduce the number of growing degree days that are required for a hybrid to reach black layer. Um, growing degree days, again, we talked about them earlier, very important as hybrids mature. But some math, uh, well, you take a look at our earliest hybrid uh, that we sell, it's a 91-day corn, 4110 V2P, and uh, it takes 2,320 growing degree days for that hybrid to black layer. And when I compare that, to the latest maturity hybrid that we sell, 6967 VR, that's 119 day corn that takes 2860 growing degree days. So you see about a 540 number of growing degree days difference between those two hybrids, okay? So certainly longer maturity hybrids take more, um, but let, let's take a look at, at why I would not be turning in my 110 day corn in central Indiana or maybe in northern Iowa or northern Michigan um, you can still feel good about planting 102 or 104 day corn. A few years ago, some data put together that showed starting May 1, you can subtract 6.8 growing degree days per day of delayed planting from the total growing degree days required for that hybrid to black layer. Okay, so that's a, that's a lot of math there, and I'm not I'm not great at math, as many people will tell you, but let's go through an example of that. So. BEC 5828, one of our top selling hybrids, is a 110-day relative maturity hybrid. It takes 2,650 growing degree days for that hybrid to black layer. So let's take an example. I went out and planted that on my farm on May 31st. Uh, I had a good plan to get in the field in April, but it got wet, uh, stayed wet, and I just couldn't get out there till May 31st. Okay, so let's do a little math. That original 2,650 growing degree units Day, excuse me, I can subtract 6.8 times 30 from that. And so now I effectively only need 2,446 growing degree days for that hybrid to mature. And so as I look back at our product guide and I compare that to hybrids in there, I see that 5162A3, which is a 101 day relative maturity hybrid, takes about 2,450, so very similar. So effectively now, 5828 planted on May 31st will now mature like a 101-day corn, okay? So as you think about those decisions, and again, it's emotion that drives us into wanting to plant earlier maturity hybrids. And yet we look at logic and we do the math, we see that our 110-day corn in this scenario um, can perform and mature like a 101-day corn. And so I think it's not time at this point um, to be trading in longer maturity hybrids. Uh, we get to June 10th, then I might think about it, or even in that case, trading them in and planting beans. But, but a decision now is, is, in my opinion, is not a great decision to shorten up maturities on our hybrids. There's another reason that we don't want to change hybrids and, and um, move from hybrid A to hybrid B just for the sake of reducing maturity. Um, there's a reason you placed or we placed that hybrid in that field, okay? It was the best fit. It met all your criteria as a grower for stalk strength, for leaf health, um, for all the things that you place importance on, obviously for yield, okay? We don't pick hybrids that don't yield in those fields. And so there's a reason we place that. Um, and so when we deviate from that plan, we may have five or six reasons we chose hybrid A. And yet when we deviate from that plan to a shorter maturity hybrid, we still might bring along it might match two or three of those areas of criteria, but it may not match the other two or three. And so ultimately, we're reducing yield. There's a great value in hybrid placement. If you talk to our hybrid placement folks or your seed advisor or your seed dealer, you know that depending on how you do the math, hybrid placement, getting the right hybrid in the right field is very easily 25 bushel uh, difference, okay? Take a look at a plot you plant in, you know, does every hybrid in a plot you plant in your backyard yield the same. No, there's very often, I've even seen 50 bushel difference from the highest yielding hybrid to the lowest yielding hybrid. And so 
hybrid placement is key. We've got a lot of people at Bex that work really hard to get the right hybrid in the right field. And so there's, there's some value there as well that you throw away uh, when you move to hybrids just for the sake of shorting up those maturities. When you think about early maturity versus late maturity hybrids, um, you know, as you move from, a, on the average, when you move from 110-day corn to 101-day corn, uh, you're probably giving up some leaf health. You're probably giving up some stress and heat tolerance. Those hybrids are bred in northern areas. Um, you know, we test them in a lot of areas, but, but very often some of those short maturity hybrids are not going to perform with the heat and the moisture, or excuse me, heat and lack of moisture stress you may experience in your area. And so shortening up for that reason can also cost us bushels and cost us money. And the other news is, yeah, it's late and we're not getting the field as soon as we could. But remember, we can plant about 50% of our crop, and I talk about nationwide there, not just maybe on your farm or your neighbor's farm, but we can plant 50% of a crop in about seven days when conditions are right. Okay. And I know it's the 11th of May, uh, but that's still relatively early, um, and it's certainly better than being the 11th of June. And so that's why we wanted to have this conversation today, share with you some of this information so that uh, you, again, make that logical decision going forward. Some take-home thoughts today. I know there's many topics I could cover. I didn't get into, you know, how to replant, how to break up a crust on a field that's got a crust on it. Many things we didn't cover, but I just wanted to share with you some math and some logic. Um, take-home things I would like to share with you today. Finish planting that first crop before you make this decision. Uh, most of the people are not done planting corn, and so it's, I think it's wise that we finish planting all the corn before we come back and make any replant decisions. Very often, Mother Nature uh, gives us another opportunity to have a better stand and, a, and uh, not have to replant. I was in some fields yesterday with some growers, uh, but four days ago, we're ready to tear up the whole farm. Uh, and, to, and yesterday, uh, things had got that much better just in a three or four day time period, some sunshine, some wind, and now we have stands uh, out there that we think we can live with. So finish planting that, that first crop before you make that decision about replanting uh, any of those fields. Make a logical, informed decision, not an emotional one. We've talked about that through the whole presentation. Um, it's very important that you let logic rule the day. It's very difficult. We get that. Uh, I'm an emotional guy, um, just like a lot of you are. And so just taking the time, letting it sit. And that's another reason to wait a little bit. Uh, we tend to make those seat-of-the-pants decisions, and they're emotional. If we just give it a little time, very often logic will win, win over. Replant is not free. I didn't get into that. I debated where to look at the cost of replant. I can tell you, based upon data, looking at some data from Ohio State the other day, that uh, depending on what operations take place as you replant, you're looking at $33 to $35 per acre minimum. And that's not even including the seed cost, because, as you know, at Bex a replant is free so uh, from a seed perspective, but from the total cost to go out there and move across that field again, potentially change your inputs or add some inputs that you didn't plan on using, um, it is not free. Stick to the plan. Um, you know, the, you had an original plan. It was a well laid out plan. You spent a lot of time putting that thing together. Um, and if we go out and start shortening up hybrids, or tearing up good stands of corn um, and deviating from the plan, then very often that's going to cost us money. It was a good plan back on April 15th. Um, it's still, for the most part, going to be a very, very good plan on May 15th. Um, it gets to be June 15th, then we'll, then we'll have another webinar and we'll talk about that and what those decisions need to be. And again, um, you're not alone in these decisions. You can contact your BEX dealer seed advisor or field agronomist, we'd love to come out, help you make those decisions. And, and I guess the thing I'd like to add here at the end, we've seen a lot of reasons maybe why we shouldn't shorten up maturity of hybrids or we shouldn't replant. Ultimately, that's your decision. Um, our replant is free. We're happy to bring it to you uh, or, or uh, make sure it gets in your hands. Um, our goal here today is not to talk you out of replant. If you need to replant, um, then that's what needs to happen. But we want to hopefully give you some, some nuggets of information that will help you make a good decision and remove that emotion uh, from that decision to either replant or uh, other decisions related to delayed planting. 
we have some questions. I don't know, Jim, you got yep. anybody you, been writing some in? Yes, and if you have questions, feel free to enter them in the, the uh, question box on the lower right-hand part of your screen. So we've got a couple, Brent. Um, how should I adjust or adapt my populations for corn and bean with late planting? Do I need to change it up, down? What do I need to do there? And then the other one was, it's the question you got the other day is, starters. Do I do I need to yeah. change my plan as it relates to starters when I go into delayed planting or replant? Yeah, great question. Um, as far as corn goes, because the soils are warming, um, I would not adjust up my corn planting population. And depending on where I was, if, if the field in question as far as replant on corn was something I planted the 10th of April and I bumped my population up to 36,000, let's say, for that scenario, I'd probably go back down to your normal population. Uh, I wouldn't reduce uh, it little, if any, but I definitely would not would not bump up. Now, beans, a little bit different story. Uh, as we move later, especially as we move late into the month of May, my thumb rule is once I get to Memorial Day, every week after Memorial Day weekend, I'm going to add 10% to my seeding rate on soybeans, okay? So if I'm two weeks out, I'm gonna be at 20% more. If I'm three weeks out, I'm 30% more than my targeted seeding rate. Uh, and the main goal there is just to encourage more vegetative growth uh, in those soybeans, uh, because I know that I'm not gonna get that planted that late in the season. Uh, second part of that question, Jim, was, remind me. Starter, should starter. I use a starter? What's yeah. the idea? So, so you put a starter down with corn and you planted uh, in some cases, depending on soil type, I kind of look at it from a soil type perspective. Uh, if you can come, if you have RTK and come right back in where you originally planted, um, then, then I don't think you probably need to do that in higher organic matter soils. Now, what becomes a concern, especially with heavy rainfall in some of your sandy or low organic matter soils, is the micronutrient pack that most of you are putting in there. Um, I become concerned about my sulfur and my magnesium uh, things that I had in that pop-up or in that two-by-two two that probably aren't there in the root zone anymore because that organic, low organic matter soil is not holding on to those. And so it may be worthwhile to come back in, whether it's in furrow or two-by-two, two, with a lower amount of starter, but just enough to be a carrier for that micronutrient pack, which is usually relatively inexpensive in the whole whole cost of things. So. How about, Brent, a uh, question came up, what's, what's the best way to terminate my stand if I do need to replant? Should I just rip it up if I'm a no-tiller? What are some thoughts there yeah. about the most effective way to terminate a stand? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Um, you know, if you're conventional till, I always believe that it's good to go out there and, and tear it up, whether it's a little field cultivator, a disc, I prefer the field cultivator. I've um, seen some guys go out there with vertical tillage tools, turbo tills, and it looks like it's really doing a good job, but I've seen a fair amount of corn survive that. And so you got to be a little more aggressive than that. Um, when you get to no-till and you start using chemistry, uh, it becomes a much more difficult equation. Um, you can use select, but you've got a six-day window that you've got to wait after you apply the select. Um, certainly, a lot of people have used gramoxone or spike gramoxone with atrazine. Uh, my personal experience with that has not been good. The best I've ever seen even spiking the gramoxone with atrazine is about 75% kill, uh, and very often I've experienced less than 50% uh, in that scenario. So uh, those are two options. Obviously, we can use some Assure, uh, some grass killer to go out there. That may be the best option that's kind of middle of the road as far as cost goes um, to eliminate uh, that stand of corn. Uh, if it's non-GMO corn, it's a pretty easy decision. Um, uh, but if it's GM corn, it's obviously most of it are tolerant to Roundup and Liberty, um, and so it's a, it's a tough to spray with one of those products. Uh, not going to get a kill on traded corn. So, Brent, a question, and and I think we can address this even after the webinar. Um, one of the questions is: Does the, the the return by date change as I move, you know, maybe Northern Ohio or Iowa, or, or you know, how much does it vary? Yeah, I think. I think the big difference between, let's say, Michigan and, and Minnesota and Wisconsin and northern Iowa is that um, you're probably going to, you know, especially in, let's say, a delayed planting scenario is you're probably going to be a little quicker to pull the trigger on a shorter maturity product. If I'm in northern Iowa, Wisconsin, then, and i got some 110-day corn, I'm probably not going to wait till June 1 to, to flip over to something earlier maturity. Um, certainly, if I'm in most the rest of our marking area, I can feel confident planting 110 day corn uh, up, up until, you know, way into June. So, uh, and from a replant perspective, um, I, don't, I don't know there's any differences. Uh, I, I've not made 
any differences between what stands I would keep and what I wouldn't. Certainly you have a shorter growing season and the biggest concern in my mind is corn uh, because we just don't accumulate heat in those areas, especially like in the thumb of Michigan, uh, northern Michigan and parts of Wisconsin and, and uh, northern Iowa. Any other questions? We're going to wait uh, just a little bit here. It's, there's been a few questions pop in. We'll wait one minute. Um, so, Bryn, as I listen and, and learn from you, I guess kind of what I'm hearing is, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it, it's probably wise for, in most cases <clears throat> if I've got a stand that I planted in, you know, late April, if I've got that 20, you know, 20 to 25,000 range, it's probably wise to keep. Because one of the things is, and you think you mentioned this, just because we replant doesn't mean we'll get a stand when we replant, right? Yeah. Actually, I didn't mention that. I'm glad you did, Jim. Yeah, my, my thumb rule right now, uh, you can look at that chart and analyze that thing to death, but basically today in the area that I cover, and I think it, it's going to be pretty applicable to most of the areas that we sell seed in, if I've got over 25,000 stand out there, even if it's not the most even, the most perfect stand I've got, I probably walk out of that field and never look back. Um, it becomes when I'm between 20 and 25 that you start using that chart and analyzing the numbers a little bit and look at the uniformity of that stand, look at look at a lot of other factors. When can you get back in the field and make that replant operation? Um, I'm going to I'm going to be a little tough as we move on a week from now. Yeah. I'm probably going to start living with 23, 22, 21 pretty quick. Certainly two weeks from now, I'm I'm going to live with 20 and probably have to walk out of the field. When you get below 20, um, you know, some of that data, if you look at 18 and 19, it tells you that you can keep a stand. Um, I struggle with that a little bit with the hybrids we have today um, and all those other factors. And so I'm probably always going to replant something under 20 until we get, you know, certainly the second week of June or first week of June. Then I'm probably making a decision about, man, should I even flip over to planting beans lest I've already got my herbicide uh, applied. So. Yeah, great question, Jim, and, and that's that's um, that's kind of where I'm at in the thumb rules I use as I work with growers. All right, we just got a question here. <clears throat> so what are your thoughts, Brent, on how long will that corn seed remain viable if it's got, you know, like a half-inch coleoptile, it's not quite emerged, and it's sitting there in saturated soils? What, what can I expect? What should I think about there? Yeah, um, you know, it's certainly different today than it was 20 years ago when I started in the seed business and, and was an agronomist 20 years ago. Um, seed lasts much longer. Our treatments are much better. Um, we spend a lot of time with Escalate, um, getting the right product mix, getting the right polymers and the things that hold that on the seed. So treatments are better and hybrids are more vigorous. And so last year, for example, and we were cold and wet in the month of May and I saw corn that had sat there for three weeks, never even put a shoot out and yet we had almost perfect stands in some of those fields. And so uh, the scenario that I've been in and seen a lot of is you've got corn that was planted last week that doesn't even have a sprout on it and it's sitting in a saturated soil. That's the seed that I'm most worried about because that seed last week, its first drink of water was a cold drink of water and that, that's my biggest concern. If I go back to the week before that, not quite as concerned, a lot of that corn has a sprout on it. Uh, everything else the same, I would like to have that seed be emerged uh, or at least spiked and I know I can tolerate a lot of cool and wet weather. In fact, we've had a frost come through in some areas, frosted corn off, but I've dug it up and it still continues to grow. So, so it can last to three weeks even in wet saturated soils. Um, actually in this case, uh, looking at seed quality in that kind of anaerobic environment, it's actually better that it's a little cool uh, because if it was totally saturated and warm, it wouldn't last nearly as long. Now, some people think, well, if it's warm, it's gonna come up. Well, not in some of those totally saturated soils. One of those ingredients for a corn uh, seed to emerge is oxygen. And when we're totally saturated, um, there's no oxygen down there. And so, actually, that's bought us time. And I really feel like three weeks is kind of that number. Um, I've seen seed last longer, and I've seen seed get rotten before. But uh, the, the kind of time and the polymers and the things we're using that hold that treatment on there, um, I can think you can feel very confident that three weeks is, and even longer, is that is that magic number. You know, it's interesting. I was uh, looking at a field here, Brent, west of the office, and we planted it before that big front came through. The field actually had four feet of water on it. It drained off. We started digging, and I was shocked. The seed was still firm, and we had a like all oh, just a sprout about maybe an eighth of an inch long, but it was healthy. And I, I'll be honest with you, I thought that field's a goner. And when I looked at it, all the seeds were okay. I mean, 
you know, maybe it's not going to be, you know, 400 bushel field, but I was surprised. It looked like it's going to survive, so it surprised yeah. me a little bit. Yep, yesterday I was with one of our seed advisors up around Bluffton in Indiana, and we were looking at some fields, and, and uh, you know, he and I, the longer we looked at the cornfields, we realized that the rain, the amount of rainfall we had was kind of immaterial because when you look at the weather and the heat that we've accumulated this past weekend in a great deal of the Corn Belt, we didn't accumulate any heat, at least from a mathematical perspective. Um, and so it's a, it's not surprising that some of the seed has been in the two two weeks in the ground and just has a sprout on it. And so many people think that uh, because it just has a sprout on it, it's two weeks in, there's no way that corn is going to emerge. And yet when you look at it, feel that seed, it's still firm, okay? And it just needs some heat. Uh, and that's what we've really lacked. So probably the lack of heat has been the highest contributing factor, even more than the saturated wet soils, because in a lot of cases that, that water got away relatively quickly. So. All right, last question. Uh, corn's just emerged. The kernel's soft, and when you squish the kernel, you know, you get that runny starch to come mm -hmm. out of it. Will it survive? What do you think? Well, if it's emerged, then I'm not so concerned about the condition of that seed, although that, that, that seedling is still feeding some from that seed. If I squeeze and pinch on that stem and it's still white and firm, um, then I believe that plant is still healthy. Now, lots of things could happen. Could it be infected with pythium or seedling blight? Yeah, it could. Um, we've gone to great measures this year and added a new fungicide to escalate that gives a really a step change uh, improvement in our tolerance to pythium and seedling blight. So that, that is a ways we could lose stand after emergence. But I'd much rather have a plant up and out of the ground right now during these tough, tough conditions uh, than I would have them laying there in wet, saturated soils and not have it be germinated. Okay, and which, to your point, Brad, means we still need to scout our fields even after emergence. I mean, there could be seedling blights or things like that affecting the stand as well. So if you got a stand, keep scouting it because these wet, saturated conditions, uh, it could be could still be something we need to pay attention to. Exactly, Jim. Very so. good point. So, folks, it's uh, we, we promised uh, 30 to 45 minutes. I think we've kind of hit the questions for now. Um, here's, I think, the take-home points from our perspective. Is uh, here, Bex, we're here to walk beside you with the, through this difficult and challenging process. We've got a great team of seed advisors and agronomists. We want to help make the best recommendations that help you succeed. That's what we're here to do. Um, we did record this webinar, and we will uh, send it out via social media or email, email to you. Both, okay? So uh, you'll have a chance to listen to it, see the, ch see the charts, graphs, listen to it again. Um, we're very appreciative of your time. We know time is very valuable. If uh, you have any questions, feel free, again, to reach out to your seed advisors, your dealers, your uh, field agronomist. Uh, again, we're here to help. Um, Brent, any closing remarks? Any final thoughts? No, nope. it's, uh, you know, how we respond to adversity often, often is the measure of our, uh, our character and the measure of whether we are, uh, you know, profitable in any given year. Uh, and again, I'd encourage you to, uh, you know, it's okay to be an emotional person, but let's try to eliminate as much of those emotions out of that replant or delayed planning decision. And in the end, we'll end up uh, making logical decisions that make us more money. And that's our goal at VEX is to help you succeed as a grower. Um, that's why we do practical farm research. That's why we do webinars like this uh, to hopefully inform and educate. So appreciate you taking time out of your day. Thanks, everybody. Again, we will record this and get this out to you, or it has been recorded. We'll get it out to you. Let us know how we can help. We are here to serve you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.